So yesterday was day two of fall legislative veto session at the Illinois State House, and of course my full-time gig has me with the Center Square and Illinois Radio Network covering what's going on in Springfield, and uh, we were anticipating a lot of activity. Uh, didn't really see too much of that, uh, at least when it comes to substantive measures that were being uh, considered and ultimately passed. Uh, one thing that we have seen uh, time and again is families that are showing up with their children, and these families are benefiting from the uh, Invest in Kids School Scholarship Program, and uh, they are, are showing up and having their voice heard. Here's just some of the uh, the kids that were chanting. That deafened me. I'm sure it deafened you as well. Uh, but obviously, that was something that was heard in the halls of uh, Springfield Capital, uh, where I was uh, able to see some of these kids and uh, their passion for their scholarship. So we haven't we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen the the uh, movement of an update to the Invest in Kids School Choice Scholarship Program, uh, and that's a, a big issue that a lot of people have with uh, how exactly they're going to be able to continue forward with this scholarship. Uh, but uh, the House didn't take it up, the Senate didn't take it up, and the House canceled today. The Senate's in, but they don't have any committees can uh, scheduled today. So I think they're just going to gavel in and get their per diem, and then uh, go home for the weekend and for the week. And then they both come back November 7th. Uh, so they'll finish up three days left. But there's a lot of unfinished business, including that Invest in Kids School Scholarship Program, which expires at the end of the year if they don't actually update it. Uh, but uh, you also had the Senate uh, move forward with a measure that covers EV charging stations for homes. Uh, this already passed before, but they had a cleanup bill. Uh, and this is, uh, again, you know, my my colleague, uh, Andrew Hensel at the Center Square, he covered this story uh, to let us know about uh, Senate Bill 384, uh, which uh, led to some debate about, uh, well, exactly who's going to have to cover the costs for these uh, electric vehicle charging stations uh, to, to be mandated in multifamily uh, residences and uh, new new residents and so on. Uh, so, again, here's uh, some of how uh, that debate played out between uh, two state senators from both sides of the aisle uh, debating on this uh, this mandate for electric vehicle charging stations. I think this is another instance of, as my colleagues have said, raising uh, raising the cost of housing and, again, telling property owners uh, what they have to do with their property. The landlord can't charge me $400 for the spot and you $200 for yours. They can't raise the price because I have an electric vehicle. Okay, that, that is not, le that is stipulated in the legislation. But the renter has to pay the cost of the electricity and the charging station. Without this legislation, I can't see a situation where any landlord, any landlord, if I was a tenant and said, hey, I want a charging station and I'm going to pay for it to improve the property value, that a landlord would say no. Like if, if I'm paying for it to improve the property value of somebody that, that lives there that doesn't own it and they have to pay me to do it, you don't need this legislation to do that. Like anybody is going to do that. I will tell you that there are some landlords, and in my district in particular, some condominium associations that really don't know what to do here. The law, the current law, sort of stipulates this as an accommodation and, and explains who pays for what and under what conditions. So... Uh... They got to clarify the law they passed because the condominium associations are like, well, we don't know what to do here. Uh, so, uh, again, another measure that Republicans say was rushed and passed and 
they had to have some cleanup language, uh, and there they are again in veto session having to debate that. So that measure ultimately passed. Another measure that passed the Senate, uh, it uh, deals with something the governor had vetoed or gave an amendatory veto of, and that is dealing with religious school lunches. Governor J.B. Pritzker vetoing a prior bill uh, requiring the state's public schools and hospitals to offer kosher and other religious-based dietary options. The governor had said local school districts, rather than the State Board of Education, have that understanding of local needs. But the new legislation addresses the governor's concerns. So they actually did deal with some veto session stuff yesterday in the Illinois Senate. Uh, but another measure that they did not deal with when it comes to veto session is the high power transmission lines. Uh, apparently, the sponsor of that measure is not going to uh, advance uh, a potential override. Uh, and they're not going to try to craft legislation to comport with what the governor is seeking. Uh, they're actually going to uh, hold some public hearings to to really discuss this. And what's the what's the per what's the uh, thing behind this right of first refusal? Well, the governor vetoed it, saying that uh, he's worried this would create a uh, a monopoly of sorts and a monopoly of uh, utility transmission line uh, construction being given to the likes of Amarin. Uh, when you have uh, questions of you know competitive bidding and keeping costs down for the ratepayers and sort. Uh, but uh, this this measure that would give Amron that right of first refusal for the construction of new power transmission lines being supported by unions, having bipartisan support as well. Uh, and uh, the supporters of changing the law to give Amron that right of first refusal uh, that uh, they held a news conference saying that they're not going to pursue an override. They're going to instead have some uh, public hearings of sorts. Uh, here is uh, a, a couple of the supporters, including the uh, the state representative legislative sponsor. Members of the L other Illinois labor unions who work on these transmission projects live here, are active in their communities, and contribute to the Illinois economy. The out-of-state utilities that are attempting to gain access to these projects will not use Illinois union labor. The absence of ROFR in Illinois could pave the way for private income-driven companies to monopolize the transmission assets without any regulatory oversight from the state. This scenario raises concerns about the lack of control Illinois regulators would have over the private entities, potentially resulting in inflated costs being passed <clears throat> excuse me, onto the ratepayers. We're not going to carry or try to override the veto, the amendatory veto on House Bill 3445. We're going to go and educate members and legislators there was an argument that this thing was done in the dark, which it wasn't, but it, the process is the process. We're going to open that door. We're going to put subject matters out in the spring. We're going to work through this in the uh, spring legislator to convince legislators, the governor's office, the ratepayers, the community on what right of first refusal actually is and the policy. And when they hear that, they're going, I believe, agree with us that this is the right step for Illinois. So you got the sponsor there, Larry Walsh Jr., and the union representative saying that they're uh, not going to advance in a veto override. Instead, they're going to take a step back and have uh, more public hearings. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the veto session specific measures that typically, you know, the governor deals with a veto, and then you have the legislature deal with it. So those are some of the, uh, the particulars there. Uh, but you have... Another issue that took a lot of oxygen out of the room yesterday, and it's an issue that requires, doesn't require, it allows for state house staffers to unionize. And there's been a lot written about this. There's been a lot debated about this. Uh, you've got uh, all kinds of pub publications writing story after story after story about this. Uh, and uh, the contention between the Illinois House Speaker, Emanuel Chris Welch, and those who are wanting to create a union, especially considering that the state just approved a constitutional amendment to Illinois' constitution uh, giving the right of collective bargaining um, space in the constitution. Uh, so it's, it's codified now in the constitution that workers have a right to collectively bargain uh, and they can form a union if they want. Uh, so clearly uh, there was some contention about whether or not state house staffers could unionize. Uh, especially those coming from uh, Speaker Welch's office, who Speaker Welch advocated for that measure to uh, codify um, the rights to collectively bargain. 
Uh, and uh, there was there was some connection. So a lot of written about this, but it only impacts around 200 people specific to staffers at the Illinois State House. Uh, the debates got a little interesting at times yesterday. Here's uh, Republican State Representative C.D. Davidsmeyer and uh, Speaker Welch going back and forth about um, what exactly this uh, this means for Republican staffers and Democrat staffers. Our staff is tasked with the job of uh, figuring out why something is written a certain way. Not only that, but going through page by page to figure out what changes were actually made. And, and I, I want to just get this on the record that you assure us that when, say, the Safety Act is passed at 2.30 in the morning, that our staff will have ample time to review that within the constraints of time. Because we know that one of the, one of the uh, gripes from um, members of, of your staff has been the hours and sometimes the working conditions. So uh, I just want to make sure that we are given ample amount of time because at 2.30 in the morning, they may not be able to call an association or something like that to, to get the background of why something was written, written a certain way. As I said to you yesterday in committee, since I've been speaker, I have been committed to making this place run better. We have continued to improve our processes, continue to try to do better, continue to try to give you more time to read bills. We were very intentional about doing our budget different than we've ever done it before. And instead of using that ample time to read the budget, you wrapped it in a bow and stuck it on the desk. I would have recommended you use that ample time instead of wrapping it in a bowl to read the budget. I, because, I didn't wrap any budget if you, in any. if you read the budget, you would have seen in that document that you voted no to that your caucus of 40 members get the same amount of money that our caucus gets with 78. Your members are getting paid more money than our uh, members, staff, because you have the same amount of money that we do, even though you vote no. I, this so wasn't a don't talk to me about fairness. We're here trying to do something better for our staff. But what is really wrong here is that your staff makes more than my staff because, and you don't even vote for the budget. Think about what's wrong with that. We Think about what's wrong with that. And apparently we haven't had issues with staff retention that, that uh, your side Because has Democrats vote for a budget that pay them. And you're the ones having issues with retention. So uh, I just... Uh, you have retention issues too, Representative. But they're less because Democrats vote for a budget that give you the same amount of money that we have to run a much larger staff. So just do the math. So, again, we could go on and on. The debate lasted a good hour or so. Uh, and they talked about it for two hours in a House committee. It only impacts about 200 people. Of course, uh, Janice V. AFSCME, landmark uh, U.S. Supreme Court case that started from Illinois, uh, really did uh, you know, deal with public employee unions and says that you cannot be forced into a public employee union. So, uh, interesting to, to see how that will work with all of this. Of course, the House passed it. It's got to go to the Senate and be talked about in committee and then pass there. Uh, while it only impacts 200 people, I think uh, David's Meyer did make an interesting point there about the issue of, you know, making sure that we're not out at two o'clock in the morning uh, with legislation getting ready to pass final passage uh, and uh, not having uh, consideration for the staffers to actually do proper research and to get reaction from the stakeholders at what, 1.30 in the morning before it finally passes. Uh, so uh, clearly there's uh, some concerns there that that does impact a lot more than just 200 people, just the functionality of the state house, which is always fascinating because having on being on the ground covering it, uh, they do things in the last minute, which really kind of concerns me actually, because three, uh, three days next, uh, next session week, which is not next week, it's the week following. So November 7th, they come back for the final three days of legislative session. I imagine it's going to be uh, rather chaotic, uh, especially 
with the issue of the Invest in Kids program. And if you heard some of that debate there on the floor, uh, you heard again uh, some of the uh, the kids off in the background, very faint in the background, uh, chanting. Uh, they want uh, you know their scholarship to be uh, restored. Uh, so clearly uh, that's going to be another major issue. They did not deal with it this week. I don't think that the Senate's going to deal with it either. <laughs> So, yeah, um, we'll see. We'll see how this plays. Ah, oh, Springfield. Good times. All right, that's all I got for you today. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, of course, uh, you'll hear a lot more uh, throughout the day on that uh, breaking story overnight of a uh, mass shooting incident that... Uh, has uh, really captured the nation's attention and how that's going to be uh, politicized over the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, obviously, uh, you've got victims, 20 some odd victims, 80 plus people shot. Uh, it's not a pretty situation. And uh, last I saw since going live, suspects still on the loose. So we'll be watching uh, for, for updates there. All right, guys, have yourself a great rest of the Thursday. Uh, hold those close to you that you love. Uh, you know, watch for your exits, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you back here tomorrow. It is Bishop on Air. Follow me anywhere. Just search Bishop on Air.